So let's move on and, and, and talk about our, our next subject in group chat. Uh, this is where we kind of dissect like the biggest story of the week, the one that's not just a gadget, but something that's really impacting our lives uh, in often unfortunate ways. Um, and so, again, we're recording this on a Thursday morning. It is December 1st. And officially today, um, changes go into effect to Rule 41, um, which is governing it's a rule governing uh how warrants and searches and seizures are executed um it's 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 a complicated complicated issue mm -hmm. um and we're gonna do our best to kind of try and break it down in an easy to digest way and what these changes mean so under the way the rules functioned previously basically um you had to go to a judge in the district where uh, the crime was committed or whatever mm -hmm. and to get the warrants and stuff. Um, the problem is that in our modern technologically uh, connected world, the perpetrators of crimes, the victims of crimes aren't necessarily in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes electronic crimes, hacks and stuff like that uh, bounce around between multiple jurisdictions because of things like where servers are hosted, where the other, where the criminal is uh, placed, and where they might have multiple victims, sometimes hundreds of victims who are scattered all over the country. And so this kind of poses problems for collecting evidence. Um, and so they, these changes are going to affect an attempt to kind of address those. Does one of you guys kind of want to break down what the changes are? Or do you want me to kind of keep going? I think I think you should keep okay. going, Terrence. <laughs> I have like I have a sense of this news, but uh, I have unfortunately been buried with a lot. I mean, of essentially, things. no warrant required for the FBI to yeah. hack into a person's computer. Uh, that's partially mm -hmm. true. I think that's um, probably a little bit of an oversimplification. So mm -hmm. they are. What it basically does is it lowers the barrier for entry for a lot of warrants. It, in most ways, basically, it says that um, a judge a can a judge can issue a warrant for search and seizure of data and stuff, regardless of jurisdiction. Okay. Um, it has to meet a certain number of requirements. I have to double check exactly what those are. I think it's like one of them is if it impacts like five different uh, districts, then you can do it no matter where it is. Um, and then there's rules about uh, whether or not the computer has been using. Um, privacy protection tools to mask their identity, mm -hmm. or if there is evidence that the machine in question has been compromised otherwise. Um, again. And then we're left with a pretty wide net still. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, it's, it's, it's less an issue of not, have, not needing a warrant, but it's an issue of the barrier for entry for those warrants being greatly, uh, greatly lowered. They, that could bars, either, they could be like stamped at this point. Yeah. Like just stamp them out to get there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess mm -hmm. let's start with the most basic part, which sure. is it's pretty clear that the existing rules don't work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we live in a world where cyber crimes, and I hate the word cyber so much, but <laughs> whatever. It, as long what, as you're not saying the cyber. Yeah. Um, it's the unfortunately, the agreed upon way of describing these things at this point. Uh, you know, it, it, these these things are increasing. Um, we have seen so many hacks this year of tons of different people, of tons of different businesses. Uh, we even found, you know, we had that the revelation of the massive Yahoo hack that happened two years ago. Um, basically, like these things are becoming increasingly difficult to prosecute because mm -hmm. our law system is structured so that you know they're focused on localities as opposed yep. to a much larger national scale. Um, I think the problem is, do these do these rules changes address those problems, one? Right. Uh, I mean, it seems like, what, they're just relaxing the rules so that it's easier for, you know, law, law enforcement to do what they need to do. Um, but mostly it shows, like, we have, there's a need for... I don't know, some sort of like cyber law or something like some sort of like division where we're actually thinking more about uh, crimes and what they mean in like a in a world where there is no physical locations, you know. Well, I guess mm -hmm. that's that brings up an interesting mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting points of this, which is the changes to the rules 
are not a law per mm-hmm. se. Um, you know, this this is not a change that came up about because Congress presented a bill and voted on it. Um, this was basically like a court said, "Sure, you can have this right. uh, expanded power." The precedent changed, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the Department of Justice was like, yeah, yeah. super excited. They were like, yeah, hacking. <laughs> um, and Congress failed to act. Okay. Uh, Dana, you did you see this news yesterday, the, the last ditch effort to kind of block it? I did. It was an effort on the part of um, a bipartisan group of senators. There were a couple Democrats in there, I think at least one Republican. And um, it didn't even seem that they were arguing with the potential benefits of this law. I don't think anyone is arguing with the necessity to locate the center of a botnet botnet mm-hmm. attack, mm-hmm. necessarily. Um, but they're worried about things like abuses, uh, potentials for abuse, um, and um, are, seem to be looking for um, more safeguards mm-hmm. against that. Um, it, so it, it's hard to argue with that and it's it's also hard to argue at least with the intention the stated intentions of yeah. the law even if the law itself seems to cast a wide or maybe even too wide of a net yeah i mean it shows the need for just more technically oriented politicians in general like people who who can kind of foresee the potential issues rather than the people who are just like oh yeah we need this fix so let's fix it by doing this thing you know hammering away at the problem instead of like finessing it I mean, that's been, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, an issue we've discussed several times, um, and I don't think as much of a secret to most of the American population, which is that our politicians are not the most tech-savvy people. Um, But do you find that, in particular, it seems like the law enforcement arm of the government seems particularly, uh, like, uh, not up on these things and not as in touch with the the changing technological scene as other people? I mean... Law okay, enfor- by law enforcement, you mean, um, let's say, the Department of Justice? Yes. Is it yeah. that they're not up on it or that it's not in their interest to take mm-hmm. a more transparent, um, cautious approach on this? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I, I think that's partially true. I think, you know, when you're talking law enforcement, they want the powers they want. Yeah. Um, and so there is a certain amount of you know, it's in their interest for whether it's the FBI or the Department of Justice to to expand these powers. But there seems to be uh, an inordinate level of tone deafness uh-huh. uh, when it comes to these things. Um, and I think this is one of these issues. I think that's part of the one of the things that the uh, the senators brought up, which is that, you know, there aren't enough safeguards. And that seems to be sort of the stumbling block for me, at least, which when I see the DOJ and the FBI stuff talking about this, they seem to have this idea that it, these things can't be abused. We're the good guys. Yeah. Um, and I mean, maybe that's a facetious thing. Maybe I'm giving them uh, more credit than they're due. And they're like, no, we know exactly what we're doing. We just don't <laughs> care. Um, yeah. I mean, look at what, what we know the NSA did. What we know a lot yeah. of other government agencies did and would do if, if they had more powers. Like... It also seems like there's, I'm sure there's like a generational gap in those institutions too, where maybe the older folks who have been doing this for a while, even if they're technically savvy, have a very different view of Mm -hmm. how things should work versus, you know, the younger agents or something. Um, So let's talk about the two big changes that are really kind of uh, raises some hackles amongst Mm -hmm. uh, privacy advocates and stuff, um, especially the the Electronic Frontier Foundation. so there's two. There's a couple of different changes that are happening in Rule 41, but the two big ones are uh, this. So one would grant the. I'm going to just read straight from the EFF's thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, take issue with that if you want, uh, <laughs> because they they clearly have their bias. But yeah. um, it's it's one of the cleaner descriptions of the rule changes I found. Uh, so. Basically, the first part is it grants the authority to practically any judge to issue a search warrant remotely to remotely seize, remotely access, seize, or copy data relevant to a crime when a computer is using privacy protective tools to safeguard its location. So, the the like short version of this is: Are you on a VPN? Do you use Tor? Are you changing the country uh, location for your Twitter profile in order to read tweets from someplace else? 
um, you are then potentially able to be targeted hmm. by the search warrants based purely on that. Okay. Um, and then the other one is it grants the authorization, it would grant authorization to a judge to issue a search warrant for hacking, seizing, or otherwise infiltrating computers that may be part of a botnet. In other words, if you're the victim of botnet, you might still be hacked. Exactly. So the concept here being that um, if they decide that your machine is part of a botnet, part of the way to discovering the source of said botnet might be through accessing your computer as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a whole lot of... I mean, let's start with just that before yeah. we even get to the bigger picture that's problems. that's millions and millions of people. That's not just yeah. millions and millions of people, but that's granting mm -hmm. access to people who are already a victim of yeah. a crime yeah. and granting search and seizure access to them, mm -hmm. uh, which, which just strikes me as insanely problematic, mm -hmm. uh, like on a really basic level. I mean, Dana, if I ran a botnet and infected your machine and then the government decided that because you were the victim of it, they were going to break into your machine and discovered other incriminating evidence of something unrelated. That's clearly problematic, right? Oh, absolutely. I, there are safeguards mm -hmm. for that, I, I believe, but I think we've seen in the past that though that's the sort of power that routine, routinely ends up being abused. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, and then the other issue with this, and this is one that I actually hadn't even thought of until I was doing some more research this morning, uh, which is basically that, you know, a lot of these hackers and a lot of these criminal groups, uh, and whether they're state sponsored or otherwise, um, aren't dumb. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They're very crafty. They create very complex and sophisticated pieces of malware that can do all sorts of terrible things to your machine. What is stopping somebody from creating a botnet that more or less does just enough to get the attention of the federal government mm -hmm. and then sits quietly and waits for the FBI to access a computer that is part of this botnet and then basically use that as a stepping stone to the broader government network. You just described a Mr. Robot plotline, probably, I'm, so, yeah. Potentially, but that sounds yes. like, I mean, that is 100% mm -hmm. technically feasible, right? Totally, totally uh, if I'm If I'm wrong yeah. out there, if we have uh, some cybersecurity experts mm -hmm. out there, uh, please correct me. Um, but from, yeah. from what little research I did have the ability to do today, that seems perfectly feasible and even more like conspiratorial i guess like there would there is the possibility for like a, a government agent too who's like i really i really like want to see the computers of this particular person they could easily create their own sort of hacking tool as well that would make it appear that they had a botnet on their machine and that could get that could get them legitimate reasons to get in there too so like they're there are all sorts of ways this could be worked around. That wouldn't necessarily be legal, but that also hasn't stopped, um, yeah, some government arms. And I think it's important we're mm -hmm. talking about all this, and that yes. well, uh, you know, we plan to write more about it. Yeah. On the site, especially because I think, uh, as important as this is, um, it's not going to get much airtime publicly. Mm -hmm. no. um, I think there are so many other things um, that probably seem more pressing to people. Like tweets about Hamilton audiences being mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> we're transitioning to a new administration. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many other things I think people will be reading about and talking about. And yeah. it's a real shame that this is not getting more um, public exposure now. And yeah. it wasn't during the mm -hmm. Campaign. The one person who I think really had articulate, expansive views on this sort of thing was um, Rand Paul, but he mm -hmm. obviously exited the race um, <laughs> pretty early on. Um, yeah. So it, I, I think it's just a shame in general that there isn't more of a discussion mm -hmm. right now about this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but that is why, in case you're wondering, why we should be discussing it on the podcast yeah. and on Engadget. Yeah. No, I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is how technology impacts That's us. This is how this it is, works. Super and if we don't talk stuff. about it, who else is yeah. going to be talking no. about I've it? I've seen right people now. like I, I think some readers were annoyed that we were talking about Trump in the angle of net neutrality, but that is that's our bread and butter. And also, 
everyone is talking about his stupid tweets and like all the other stuff. Like yeah. There, there are other things we should focus on. Like I'm really worried, like what a Trump administration would do with expanded hacking powers like this. Yeah. Like at some point, like if, if somebody like uh, made a bot that infected like a bunch of uh, widespread amount of Twitter users, uh, like uh, yeah, who knows what he could do against people who've said bad things about him. Yeah, and, and and to be yeah. clear, we're not worried because of Trump. Yeah. This is a troubling thing in general. Yes. Uh, every president has basically made it their goal to expand executive power. Mm-hmm. Um, when your guy is in charge, you feel okay about that because Congress might be standing in their way. But the end, the end result is that eventually your guy is not in power, and you're yeah. really going to regret those exam expanded executive powers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of people on the left who have kind of been a little bit quiet about some of the things that Obama has done, suddenly going like, oh, shit, right. Mm -hmm. We don't get to be president forever. Um, So, yeah. And I mean, and this is one of these things. It's this, people were so upset, uh, especially on the right and on the far left, uh, about the NSA spying stuff, about the bulk metadata collection things. But I think a lot of people center left and, you know, myself included, were kind of like, it's bad, but like, it's not that bad, right? Mm-hmm. And then news kept coming out and we're like, oh no, this this is actually really, really bad. Like this is real bad. And none of that has changed. Mm-hmm. And now we're all shitting ourselves basically. <laughs> um, yes. to, to be real blunt about it. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is troubling for mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of lot of reasons. Um, I don't know. Any anything else to add there? Um, I think um, just to our point about um, discussion and discourse and readers, um, let's keep the discussion going. So if yeah. you disagree mm-hmm. with what we've said today about um, Rule Forty One and its possible implications, you should. Email us. Yeah. Um, we actually, one of the best emails we got recently was from a guy named Jeremy about two weeks ago. And yes, I, I wrote, wanted to call him out on the show. Yeah, um, his name's Jeremy, and he wrote us um, really um, articulate, constructive, polite email um, disagreeing with us about net neutrality. And it was one of my favorite emails I've gotten recently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So more of that, please. Mm-hmm. If you disagree with us, um, keep the conversation going. Yeah, and as long as you're civil. That's, that's the key thing is... Yes. We understand that we have our, our biases. We're pretty upfront about that. You know, I've never made any bones about my political opinions. I don't think anybody else here has. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try to be fair about it, but that doesn't mean we're going to say things we disagree with for the sake of argument necessarily, but it means we're going to be transparent about our views. But if you disagree, we are 100% happy to engage you. Um, I, I, I'd like to actually start reading letters from readers and stuff out there. <laughs> Uh, on the air, like yeah. I'd like to get some constructive criticism, some feedback. If you, if you have thoughts about Rule Forty One, please send them in. Email us. It's podcast at Engadget, not podcasts. Podcast. <laughs> Oops, just bang the microphone. <laughs> Singular. Uh, yeah. And yeah, like if you have a good point, if there's a question around that you want answered that we didn't address here, um, I, I apologize that we are not more steeped in this issue because I think um, as Dana was saying it didn't get the attention it deserved it's the sort of thing that kind of snuck up on us um, and there are no easy answers even if we do a lot of reading um, it's hard like today it was hard for me to fully come out against rule 41 because I don't like botnets and you don't like botnets No, um, but we like privacy Mm -hmm. Um, and there is no um, simple answer to that it's hard to balance those things um Devendra, any other last thoughts? No, I'm good. I think it's it's definitely worth us paying attention to it. It also seems, I think, funny how we're sort of like uh, just like filing the breadcrumbs of like what could lead to potentially big issues down the line with the Trump presidency, uh, just in terms of net neutrality and this thing, and who knows what else could happen. Like, it seems like we're you're seeing the recipes being or the ingredients being put together that could lead to all sorts of problems down the line. So that's why we're talking about it. Yeah. Because it could be a big deal going down. All right. uh, When, Mm -hmm. where can the uh, people send their hateful tweets? (laughs) You Uh, don't need any more hateful (laughs) tweets. I mean, (laughs) I I welcome them. That's fine. I had, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I was in a Twitter war with uh, the creator of Minecraft. So that was fun. Oh, I missed this. Three million followers. So that was. The two of you both have a habit of picking Twitter fights just because you're bored. 
To be clear, or I angry. Don't, it's <laughs> mostly because I'm angry. I'm it's not because I'm bored. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I did. I, I may have gotten into it with um, F- Florian Mueller. Oh Mueller. yeah. I, yeah. Among yeah, others. Okay. Yeah, I, I've also gotten into it with Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, I don't fight unless you start with me on Twitter. Well, there you go. I have, I have a serious issue with people who are public figures yeah. who have significant followings yeah. spreading obviously misleading or obviously false information. Mm-hmm. Um, and people don't like it when you point that out. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll leave it at yeah. that. There's no need to resurrect <laughs> this stuff, but yeah. yeah. So um, I'm at Devendra <laughs> on, on Twitter. Um, yeah. Don't mess with him. Follow yeah. me for more Twitter battles. Uh, Dana, where can the fine people find you? Um, Dana Wallman, um, one word, no space. Um, please don't start a fight with me. <laughs> uh, I am. <laughs> I am at Terrence O'Brien. Lots of E's, no A's. Uh, you can start a fight with me. I will probably respond the first time and then just ignore you. Um, the mute button is fantastic. It's I so actually good. don't even do that. Do it. Um, it's just not worth it. I just eventually I go, okay, this is pointless. Um, <laughs> but seriously, we do want to continue this conversation. So s- if you can be civil and want to have like a legitimate discussion, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, email us, mm-hmm. as I said, podcast at Engadget. You can also just hit up the podcast. It's at Engadget Podcast on Twitter. Um, so yeah, so send us your comments, your questions, all of that stuff. Let's have a conversation because that's the only way uh, forward. Um, and before we go, I don't. Um, we're not going to do a comment of the week this week. Um, every episode recently, <laughs> even this one, has been ending <laughs> on kind of a downer. So I wanted to share with you a story that's uh, a little bit more uplifting, a little bit uh, happier about the power of the internet. Uh, so a friend of mine who will remain nameless, um, just because we didn't get a chance to clear it with everybody involved that they would uh, be okay with being mentioned on the air. Uh, He was the photographer at my wedding, super nice guy, awesome dude, uh, posted on Facebook, I wanna say probably about five o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday. Um, And this was, by the way, the first time I'd found out this information that um, he was looking for his biological parents, saying that, you know, he he was thankful for his adopted parents who were lovely, but that he had decided that it was time for him to find out where he really came from. Um, and he had very little information to go on. All he had was his birthday, the city he was born in, and a rough time of day. Huh. Mm-hmm. That okay. was literally it. He was like roughly 8.45 mm-hmm. p.m. on this date in Cold Spring. Mm-hmm. Didn't know the hospital, had no idea of any other information. He was just like, I'm looking for help to find my biological parents. Three and a half hours later, he was on the phone with his mom. Huh. And he's like making a connection there. He's already found so much stuff that they have in common that like. Mm -hmm. Were they happy to hear from him? uh, She was uh, reportedly. I don't know uh, if he's found his biological father necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, I only have confirmation that he, he spoke to his mother on the phone. Um, Again, this is, this is like, it's a personal thing. I don't want to pry too much. Um, I wasn't going to be like, you said your biological mom, like what else? That's pretty cool. But he, you, you have know, a sense of like how it kind of led to that, or I I don't really I'd have to really dig through okay um, all of the comments, but I mean it's just like it's there are good people out there yeah the yeah. power of the internet is actually a good thing it's one of these reminders that it's there to connect us not uh-huh. just like pry us apart into little tribes that scream at each other um, so yeah I just kind of wanted to share that like that's a happy story good. an uplifting thing yeah uh, that's the thing. So, good on you, Facebook. Uh, awesome, and congratulations to my friend who will remain nameless. Uh, we will be back next week, I believe, right? Sure. Yes. We will be back next <laughs> in, week. In some combination of people. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, until then, thank you for watching. And that's all I've got. 